Today's podcast episode is sponsored by the Reconnective Healing Global Community. I don't know if you guys remember, but back in 2020, we released an episode with Dr. Eric Pearl and Jillian Fleer about reconnective healing. He was a chiropractor who was working in his practice in Los Angeles, and his patients started to report that they were having these healings just with his hands being near them without him actually touching them. So he went on to research and try to find out what this universal wisdom was behind what was happening, and he developed the reconnective healing process. Their website is thereconnection.com, and they are offering an online level one class called The Portal to awaken your own healing ability and to learn how to do this. There's over eight hours of interactive content where you will learn to interact with energy, light, and information to experience lasting knowingness, peace, and love without limitations. They gave us a coupon code to give to all of our listeners. It is path to portal We're going to put that in the show notes, and that's 25% off of the Portal Online Level 1 course. I hope you guys enjoy. Let me know if you take it. Send me an email. would love to know how the course works for you. Hi, and thanks for tuning in to the Path 11 podcast. I am your host, April Hanna. At the Path 11 podcast, we are here trying to deliver leading edge research on consciousness, healing, and metaphysics. And just like you, we are trying to answer the big questions about life. Who are we? Why are we here? And what is our purpose? We hope by listening to our podcast, it will make each day you live on earth a little easier to understand. And now for today's podcast. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to the Path 11 podcast. If you love angels and are connected to the angelic realm, then you are going to want to listen to this entire podcast interview, or you can even watch it on Path 11 TV. I have an amazing person with me today. She is the author of this beautiful book, Angels in Waiting. Her name is Robbie Holtz. And she is an internationally respected healer and speaker. She has also worked widely as a medium, helping countless people to connect to the other side. She is co-author of the award-winning book, Secrets of Aboriginal Healing and Aboriginal Secrets of Awakening, and has this new book out, Angels in Waiting, How to Reach Out to Your Guardian Angels and Spirit Guides. So very excited. She also lives in New York, as do I. So it's always fun to have a fellow New Yorker. Robbie, welcome to the Path 11 podcast. Thank you. It's nice to be here. I'm actually, my the co-author, Judy, is in New York. I'm all the way on the other side of the country. I'm oh. in the San Juan Islands by Seattle oh, in beautiful. British Columbia. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I got to change that on your bio then. So thanks for listening. <laughs> but all right. Shout out to Judy. My fellow New York. Shout out to <laughs> Judy in New York. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So you have a really interesting story and I'm hoping too, we can talk a little bit about even your other book with the secrets of the Aboriginal healing, because you actually went to Australia, if I recall, and also with your husband too. The two of you had some intense healing done with an Aboriginal tribe there. Well, he went with, he went separately. He went in 94. Yeah. Yeah. And he went quite desperate measure to survive. He had MS and he was really had about six months to live. The doctors had given him that prognosis. And he went into the outback because he heard that the outback Aboriginal tribes people had remarkable healing abilities, which they did. And so he went in, in his wheelchair as a quadriplegic. And he was a physicist, very science oriented. There's no black and white. And, and he, unless you can prove it, it doesn't exist. That's the mindset he went into. And he came out 10 days later with feeling restored in his body that he hadn't had in seven years and was no longer quadriplegic. He was a paraplegic, but it it, it remarkably changed him in body, mind, spirit, He recognized that there's a lot of gray that exists that can't be proven, but it's still real. And the Aboriginal tribes people generously gave their healing secrets to him, their healing methods, and asked him to take it out into the world because we don't really understand how healing works, and especially the Western civilization. So that was very generous of them to give this ancient, these are the oldest continuous culture on the planet. And they gave this information to him. And we put it out there in Secrets of Aboriginal Healing. And I was really 
really shocked to, we did it at their request, and I was really shocked to see it resonate across the planet because now it's in 43 countries and published in several languages because it really resonates with people. They understand that the body, mind, spirit is involved in healing. So um, it's, it's a beautiful book about his journey into the outback, this physicist and his healing journey. And then I was invited to go, it, it was really an honor to be invited into the outback years later. Gary passed in 2007. He had gone into the outback in 90, I met him in 2001. He passed in 2007, and I was invited into the Outback in this very rare opportunity to be with Aboriginal women sharing in their ceremonies, very powerful ceremonies in 2008. So I went into the Outback and experienced these remote Aboriginal tribes people who are just operating at a very different level than we are. They, When I was there, and I, I can't describe the, the ceremonies, but that it, that trip, among other things, is described in Aboriginal Secrets of Awakening. But let me just say that when I was in the outback doing these ceremonies, you could feel that everything is one. You mm -hmm. could, it wasn't just this intellectual knowing, you could actually feel it, how everything was one. You could also feel, I felt, the tremendous love from Mother Earth, tremendous love. So it was a real life-changing opportunity for me as well as it was for my husband when we went into the Outback. So it's it, again, put that information out there as a memoir, The Awakening Book. It's now in 43 countries, over 43 countries. And I know that because people are writing to me and I started keeping track of these countries. And it's like, oh my gosh, <laughs> I'm aware of that only that there's 43 because that's who's written to me, right? So again, it resonates with people. So that's that's really kind of the beginning of that journey for me yeah and your your journey also started before with the birth of your son right so right. you you almost died <laughs> twice yeah twice. i'm an overachiever yeah yeah twice <laughs> <laughs> so when i delivered my son back in 85 and this is before i knew gary but when i delivered my son i was married to my high school sweetheart and we had a, a son that when i had that delivery it was a really rough labor and delivery because he was in an awkward position and it was a 32 36 hour delivery and so when i was done with delivering him the doctor said we can give you a blood transfusion to kind of perk you up faster and so back then i was tr given this blood transfusion that was tainted with hepatitis c they didn't know about hepatitis C back then, so they certainly didn't have the ability to cure it or heal it. So the hepatitis C almost killed me from that blood transfusion. And then the experimental treatment that they put me on almost killed me. So I almost died twice. But at this point, I was left incapacitated. I was in bed, I, I can't remember, but at least six months, couldn't function. And I was just trying to survive long enough for this little boy to remember me and to be able to parent him a little bit longer. So I set out, Western medicine didn't have anything for me. And so I set out on this journey of trying to heal myself or at least stay alive a little bit longer. And I ended up completely healing myself of what they said was incurable at the time, the hepatitis C. And at that point I had developed from the experimental treatments, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, temporary brain damage. And so I healed all of those things and it ended up being what the Aboriginals were talking about, that the emotions and the mind plays a big part in your physical wellness. So that put me on this path of passionately teaching people how to heal themselves, that they are powerful healers and how to manifest that and to take your power back. It doesn't necessarily, don't give your power over necessarily to doctors or Western medicine if it's not right for you. And so that put me on that path of getting that information out there, spreading this information from the Aboriginal people and how to heal yourself. And then when my husband passed in 2007, we were told be, a year before he passed, when, he, when Gary came back from the outback, he was remarkably changed. He started doing what the Aboriginal people were doing, where he could see into these other dimensions. He could see into the body. He could be telepathic to anything and every people. And it's very interesting when he was telepathic to people, the people who recognized he was communicating to them telepathically were autistic. They had no problem communicating to him. So he started developing this uh, daily connection to his angel, Julie. We describe it in the book, the awakening book. And 
she told him he would be leaving a year before he left. She said, you're, we need you. Your journey is finished here in this physical form and you're needed more on the other side. You can do more from the other side. So Gary and I were married. We'd been happily married and we were really upset that this was occurring because we didn't, I didn't want to lose him and he didn't want to leave. And he left, a, he left exactly a year later, 2007. And what I didn't expect though, April, was that he would continue to show up every morning after he passed. He would show up in this energetic form. It was a particular pattern of energy that he would show up. It was like the, an eyeball. And he would show up at exactly eight o'clock every morning. He was a very punctual man. And it was a joke between us that I was not. He showed up every morning at eight o'clock for weeks after he passed, which was totally blew my mind. I didn't see that coming, but it ended up, he sh helped me develop this ability to communicate to the other side. It started with him and then it kept expanding and expanding until I was working with my own healing spirit team of which he's part of that team and Aboriginal healers are also part of that healing team. So I ended up becoming medium. And the big thing that the other side really wanted us to convey, this is when Gary was around and then also to me, is please tell people to ask us to help them more. And so that's what brought about this angels in waiting because it shows clearly step-by-step step how to get that help it's, and, and how to overcome challenges with their help, how to manifest your desires with their help. It's a, it's huge. It's, it's transformational. I'm really pumped about it. Yeah. <laughs> I could feel it. And I love it. I love it. So, so let me just ask this question because our listeners might be saying, what do you mean he showed up in the form of an eyeball? So yeah, it was, that's a good word. question. That does sound, that sounds pretty bizarre, doesn't it? Well, not really to me, but you know, it's kind of like, <laughs> were you in meditation? Was this a knowing that you were like a sight unseen, but you could see in your head yeah. kind of like you do yeah. intuition or did you physically kind of always see this eyeball? That was well, it's, over you. that's a great question. It's like if you, I, my eyes were closed and it's like if you, the old, like the old days, they say the old days, it, it, like a negative, you'd see a negative and everything is reversed. Yeah. The white yeah. is black and the black is white. It's like I would see an eyeball in that reversed colors, black and white, when I close my eyes. And it would be there when I woke up before my eyes were open. I'd see it at exactly eight o'clock. If I was still in bed at eight o'clock or if I was meditating, I'd see it at exactly eight o'clock. And it got to the point where I, I, I knew it was him because it had happened when I was alive. When he, I'm sorry, when he was alive, he, uh, he was working on me. He, he got really good at healing and sending energy and he didn't even have to be in the same location and i remember one time that happened when i was in the shower my eyes were closed we describe it in the awakening book how i had my eyes closed and i saw this and i'm like is that gary and it he said yeah it was him so that was how i knew he communicated to me and interestingly enough april he also communicated to my sister the same way we had so many people coming to us for help that we needed help my sister came and helped us. And I, she said that he also came to her after he passed. And I said, how does he show up? And she just took a piece of paper and she drew the eyeball exactly the way I see it. So she was getting the exact same thing. Wow. That's kind of like really cool data too, for the two of you to have that when he's alive. I yeah. have that experience when he's sending a healing, but then yeah. also in his transition. Love that. Yeah. Talk about validation. It was pretty awesome. Exactly. Yeah. So now let's uh, rewind just a little bit too. When you were on your path to learn how to help heal yourself, what are some modalities? What did you learn or what did you turn to, to be able to cure the hepatitis C within your body? And all, it sounds like all of these immune system diagnoses, because I know he also went on to study immunology, right? Right. A PhD in immunology too. So right. um, when you're looking at MS and stuff like that, but how did you begin to heal yourself? What modalities did you use? Well, what I used is what the Aboriginal people were teaching Gary, your mind and emotions directly affect the body. And if you are in fear-based, stressful, 
negative emotions, it becomes toxic over time. And some of the hardest emotions for the body to deal with are self-hate, guilt. Guilt is a real tough one on the body, shame. And the flip side, so it's either fear-based or it's love-based, right? And then the love-based emotions have a different chemical response. Dr. Emoto showed us with his water photography how it looks very different. It's very high functioning. It's very vibrant energy. It's a different chemical response and it just helps that body become vibrant the best, some of the best emotions to heal with are forgiveness of everything and everyone involved, especially around the illness and gratitude. Gratitude is huge. So I started paying attention to, and I've been raised in a very Midwest conservative upbringing, but I had no other options. So this is when I set out to, okay, how can I heal this? I started paying attention to not just was I to what was I feeding myself emotionally? What kind of thoughts am I marinating in on a regular basis? And also what does my body want? Because I've been really good at numbing to what my body wanted. I gave it more rest. I gave it uh, natural herbs. I gave it what the liver wanted because the hepatitis C is a silent killer, uh, killer of the liver. And so the liver really needed some support. I remember making kombucha tea with this giant I mean, it was huge, but I made fresh kombucha tea all the time. This is before anybody even really was talking about that thing, kombucha. And so it was just those things of this more natural approach, listening to the body, but also paying attention to what is my mind doing? Am I focusing on getting well or am I focusing on the disease? And so just also recognizing the soul plays a part in this. It was important if I'm going to help people learn how to heal, I needed to go through that experience myself. I needed to go through what the doctor said was incurable and then heal it and teach other people how to do this as well. And so the researchers down in Seattle, I happen to be in Seattle area, and that was one of the best places to be for research on hepatitis C. The researchers down at the university were following me on a regular basis. And even after I healed this, they were consistently taking a lot of test results from me, a lot of blood, because they just couldn't understand how I healed this. And so for years, they followed me. I knew what I had done, like what I just described, but I don't think they were ready to hear that that plays the effect that it does. So it's mm-hmm. a body, mind, spirit thing. So I'm curious to know, I, I've studied a little bit in Chinese medicine and have an understanding too, and, and maybe it's not just in Chinese medicine, but that certain organs are more susceptible maybe to certain emotions, like yes. you know, lungs can hold grief. What is the limit? Yes. Yes. That's a great question. For like, if, like for instance, the kidneys are usually family related. So I, I don't remember specifically what the liver held, but that's, but that's exactly right. But let me just say that I was working way too many hours, raising a child, building a home, trying to keep a very happy, adjusted, married family life. It was way too much. And so the hepatitis attacked that liver. And I was fortunate that I was one of those people that discovered it within five years of being uh, contracting it because most people don't discover it until they're much, much older and it's done a lot of damage. But it was part of my soul's journey. I was supposed to discover it. And that's when I was in my mid thirties, actually early thirties when this all happened, never thought I'd make it to 40, never thought I'd make it to 40. And here I am 67. So it was part of that journey that was supposed to happen for me that I was supposed to have that tainted blood transfusion and be affected. But yes, you're correct. The the organs are affected by, because we hold emotions, like you were talking about the heart area, we hold grief in our chest. So if you are particularly vulnerable to, if you have a family history of heart problems or breast cancer, you really need to be paying attention to Am I releasing grief? And the Aboriginal people taught us that these emotions, they're here to be experienced, but then let go. And then what's next? Move on to what's next. So glad you said that, right? Because it's not not that we're here to be without emotion or to stop these emotions, but that is the key point of what you said. It's like experience it, feel it, take care of it, let it go. Let it go. That's a big part of it. And that's one of the things that the guides have taught me is that that we 
come to this amazing earth school here, right? It's a free will planet, but we're given a body and we're also given emotions. And we get to experience emotions that we don't on the other side. The other side is in this perfection that's stagnant for growth purposes. So one of the reasons that souls love coming to this really tough planet is because we make huge leaps in growth because there's dark and light, there's shadow and light, and there are, we're all equal as souls, but there are younger souls who tend to be materialistic, greedy, and that's fine. That's just where they are. And then there's older souls, like a lot of your listeners who are more compassionate, forgiving, accepting, but we're here getting to experience not just a physical form, which is a gift, but we're also allowed to experience on this planet emotions that we don't on the other side anger frustration depression impatience we get to experience that Mm -hmm. and the body and the emotions work together to tell you where you're getting hung up with mind stuff where your pop quizzes are so to speak when you get triggered that's a pop quiz that just came up and your body won't lie to you if it's uncomfortable physically it's telling you it's affecting you It'll tell you what emotions are unhealthy and not serving you. So this is one of the reasons that that this book that I just put out, The Angels in Waiting, is because it's a tough planet, but we were designed to have a lot of help on this journey. And there is tremendous help available to us, but because it's a free will planet, we have to ask. There's, I, I love this example because it tells me it, it, it's a, it's like a child wanting to learn how to tie their laces, and they might make a big tangled mess of it. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's part of the learning process. But when that child turns to the parent and says, "Can you help me?" then the parent steps in and helps in the way that's appropriate for that child. And it's the same thing here. They are. There's nothing wrong with pain. They've told me that many, many times. It's part of the process. It's a very pain is a very powerful catalyst and teacher, but we're making a lot more pain and struggle than was intended. And we have this tremendous help available to us, but we need to ask for it. It's like it's they've given me this example. I have this visual in my head that they're showing to me. It's like a, when a hand reaches up for help, then they are allowed to have that hand reach down and assist. But you've got to reach up and, and, and ask for help because it's a free will planet. Now, is that just for the angelic kingdom or is, are you also kind of lumping in guides, spirit guides, other helpers? All of it. All, all of, it. of it. And we only, I'm, I'm only working with benevolent beings here. But mm-hmm. we were designed to be having this help. We're, we're, it's all available to us. It's, we were designed to be using this help. It's just that the mind wants to do it all by itself. And But the difference is, and they've made this very clear to me, when we're operating on our own, it's like operating at five amps of power. When you allow their assistance, it shoots up to like 5,000. And when I was co-writing this with Judy in New York, she kept sending it back as 500. And I'm like, no, they're very clear. It shoots up from five amps of power to 5,000. I think she found that really hard to believe, but they kept saying it's that much. So this is why I'm excited about getting this information out there is because it is a powerful, tremendously loving assistance available to you for anything and everything. And the love they have for us, guides, angels, is way beyond what we're capable of comprehending as humans, Mm -hmm. way beyond what we're capable of truly understanding. And they don't have the limitations we do. They know the better way, the easier way. They can guide you. They can assist you. They can help you with anything, big, small, vague, specific, as often as you want. But please ask. You need to ask. And the cool thing about this, April, is that it's a symbiotic relationship. As we ask them to help us, they're serving out of tremendous love. So they're allowed to grow every time they're allowed to assist. And as we grow, they grow. So it's this beautiful win-win for everybody. So that's why they're saying, oh, please ask. We're here to help. Now more than ever, please let us assist you. Right. 
So let me, I'm going to ask you kind of like a skeptical question. Oh, I'd love those. Okay. <laughs> because, because, because we were supposed to record this last week yeah. and we were having technical difficulties and yeah. I have in the past before remembered to ask the angels and I heard like Archangel Michael's a great one for like electronics and stuff to ask and get the Zoom meeting to work. Yeah. I'm like angels, help, help me. I'm working with Robbie. She wrote about you. Come on, get this working. But I was like really setting my intent that yeah. maybe there was some sort of electronic glitch with Zoom and granted we're here today. It's wonderful. And who knows why, right? There could be a bigger message why we're here. But there's times like that where I'm like, this angel stuff doesn't work. Like I, <laughs> I'm asking like, and it's a small little thing and it's a different thing. Yeah. Just connect us. So, yeah. So sometimes that makes me feel like a little defeated because I know people that honestly will say, just ask and you'll receive and they'll, and I've heard magnificent, crazy, weird stories of people asking the angels for help and turning like electrical equipment on or fixing things at the yeah. last minute. And it didn't work for me last week when right. I'm trying to connect to you. So right. how do you deal with some of that disappointment and a little bit of skepticism? Because it's like, well, I I exerted my free will. I asked and yeah. we had to reschedule anyway. Right. I'm so glad you asked that because that comes up all the time with people. So they will respond, but they will respond in the way that's appropriate in the way that's best. So they will respond two ways, according to the highest and best good of all, and also that what's appropriate according to what your soul wants. But in this particular case, so trust me, April, when we weren't able to connect last week and we spent almost an hour, right, trying to connect, <laughs> I'm like, can you guys help? What's going on here? So I realized, okay, there's a reason that didn't get, we didn't connect last week. And the reason was because I had recently had my computer worked on. And even though I was able to connect with other people on Zoom, I apologize. I've got something going on here. I'll have to turn that off. Even though I was connecting on Zoom and had no problems. For you, there was a problem. And what the guides were trying to help me understand is you've got some settings that were adjusted when you had your computer worked on and you have a slew of Zoom meetings and podcasts and webinars set up for the next month because this book is coming out, including a Zoom class night. Those aren't going to work. So you need to figure that out now. And thank you, April, for being the guinea pig to help me recognize I had computer problems setting up with Zoom and didn't know it until until we went through that and that you were gracious enough to say, well, let's just do it a week later, which here we are. So even though we were asking both of us for them to help us, they were responding, but not the way we expect. OK, yeah, yeah. so that I recognize and OK, I've got a problem. I got to get this fixed. And then they immediately I, we fixed it later that day with technical help. But I would not have known that. OK, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. So they they kind of know what's for your highest and best. And it's like, oh, you're asking for help. We're going to help you. But you, right. know, you, you didn't know that had we this we didn't yeah. have this issue, then you probably would have been stuck on a lot of your other calls and you know, right, right, right. So this, <laughs> that brings up a very good point. So people are, you have to trust that it's coming the way it's needed to come in the way it's needed to come. So for instance, you might ask them, just as an example that we brought up earlier, you might ask them to help heal your breast cancer or your heart disease. But unless you let go of that grief, you can't keep grieving and expect them to heal this if you haven't learned the emotional component to it. So they won't heal the, he the, 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 the breast cancer or the heart disease until you recognize the emotional component to it, the emotional core, as the Aboriginal people taught us, the, 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 the dandelion weed, so to speak, otherwise it just keeps coming back. But they will help you first recognize the emotions that are playing a part in this. So that you're not just picking the top of a dandelion off, like, you know, having tumors removed and then just keeps coming back again. They'll help you if you say, thank you for helping me heal this. They will help you first learn, have an awareness what the emotional component is that needs to change. Then they will help you change that com component. So you release that grief. Again, it's tremendously helpful to have them help you let go of this grief rather than doing it on your own with your mind. And then they will help you if it's according to the soul's intentions, right? We're going to go according to what the soul wants as well. If the soul intends for you to be healed and the body is within certain parameters because they have certain laws that they're governed by, but if they have the green light, then they can help heal that body. Mm. So that's where you recognize they're assisting, but it may not always be the way that I expect. 
Right. And it may be too, there, it may be something else. Like we use the example of grief in the lungs, but, and there's many books out there, like a, a woman by the name, I think it's Ina Siegel has a really great, she's fabulous, a great book, Louise yeah. A, right? Yes. Like a lot of people have really studied what parts of the body holds what emotions, but I think it's always good to ask and do your own personal inventory because it could be anger and maybe it's not just all grief. Yes. You might be storing a lot of different emotions in different areas of the body. So I think yes. those references are really good. And if you've never even heard, if, if anyone listening has never even heard about this concept of emotion stored in the body, there's great references out there, but it's also good to kind of meditate it, meditate on your own. And then, like you said, ask for help. So some people might say, well, she keeps saying, just ask for help and use my free will. Is it as simple as angels, please help me? So how do you invoke, yes. and, invoke and start this help to come your way? Okay. They are telepathic to our thoughts. And so the, the guardian angels, everybody has one, whether you believe in them or not, but everybody has at least one guardian angel. They have a little bit different role. They are there to protect you and make sure that you no, don't encounter something that your soul doesn't intend to make sure that you're not injured or killed if it's not your soul's intention. They have, so they have a little bit more leeway. They're also, the guardian angels are the first responders, so to speak. They're like the gatekeepers. So, and they're also the easiest to communicate to and to develop that relationship with. So you simply say to them, thank you for helping me with. It's not a, oh, please. To me, it's not a plea and a prayer. It's a thank you because they respond. Thank you for helping me with, and you focus on what you want. So you don't say, for instance, thank you for helping me get rid of this hepatitis C, you say, thank you for helping me create a healthy, vibrant body. That's where you want to put your focus, right? Mm -hmm. So you say it in your mind and they will respond in their own timing, in their own way. Now, where a lot of people get hung up is that they expect them to be, so they decide, okay, I want to develop this connection and this is what we talk about in Angels and Waiting. And we go into all of this, how to develop a better connection, how to recognize how they're helping, how to recognize their signs. Every person is clairsentient, where you feel the guidance, especially in the solar plexus. Some people get goosebumps, some people get a tingling. Some You just get that gut feeling, that sixth sense, that instinct in the pit of your stomach. That's clairsentience. Everybody has that. It's like a muscle that some people have developed better than others. You can ask them, thank you for helping me develop that. Thank you for helping me develop a stronger connection to you. Thank you for helping me recognize you're there uh, all the time, 24 seven, because the guardian angels are there from your first breath to your last breath. They never leave you. They will call in more assistance if more assistance is needed. You have spirit guides who will show up when you're doing certain things. Maybe you have an autistic child and you need more help or when you're at work, you need different assistance, but they will come when you ask. But don't expect, that, that word expects coming up again, don't expect them to show up this, in, in, in to see them or hear them because most people are not wired that way. They will, very few people have that ability. You might get a flash now and then, you might get a, a word now and then, but that's really unusual. So I get people asking me, I, I guess they're not responding to me because I'm not seeing them, I'm not hearing them, things aren't happening the way I asked. It's like, oh, they're responding. It's just that they're not responding the way you expect. And they are responding to you. It's just that you need to feel. And that's why we need to quiet that mind so we can feel that inner guidance. They're very quiet, very subtle. And I've noticed that they are very succinct. They will respond to me before I even finish asking a question in my head. That's one of the ways I know it's them. They will also give me very quick telepathic thought answer. They might play songs in your mind where all of a sudden you just hear yourself summing, humming a phrase and you're like, Oh, pay attention to the lyrics, right? Mm -hmm. Or maybe numbers, you pay attention to numbers. So you wake up and it's 1111. Mm -hmm. There's a great angel book, Numbers by Doreen Virtue, that tells you what 1111 means. Typically, they will have, communicating to you is not a problem. They, that's their job. We're wired to pick up on it. If you miss it, they'll bring it around again. And they might bring it around in a different way. If you misinterpret it, they'll make sure that that gets changed, that you 
understand that. So one of the ways, one of the common ways that they communicate is when, again, we got to be quiet, right? So that's why meditation is a great way to develop that muscle with them. But when you first wake up, if there is a thought directly there, that is from the other side of the veil, from your guides and angels. If it's that second or third thought, okay, now it's probably the mind engaged. So you start recognizing if I do a three second, I call it a three second gut check where you know in three seconds whether something is a yes or a no. If you go beyond three seconds, okay, now the mind's engaged. Hmm. So people ask me, how can you tell the difference between angels and guides versus my mind? The mind is fear-based. It'll tell you, you have to, you should, you need to. Whereas the angels and guides, it, it's, it's directed with love. It just feels right. You have this knowing. It just feels like that's the right thing. If you don't know, ask them to make it more clear. Thank you for helping me easily pick up on your messages. Thank you for helping me easily understand what you're conveying. Thank you for helping me. I love this one, April. I love to say, to ask, thank you for helping me live the highest vision of my soul. Mm, Beautiful. Thank you for helping me let go of what's in my best interest to let go of. And then that they are allowed to help you with that. Thank you for helping me open to what's in my best interest to open to. The book, Angels in Waiting, talks about how to get their assistance with everything, whether it's career, health, relationships, how to be a better parent, a better partner, all of that. It's they're here to assist us. And the healthier and happier they can make you, that affects everyone. So what's your thoughts kind of like on the order of angels? Because I know a lot of people are familiar with the archangels, but, you know, we have a guardian angel, there's the archangels, and the archangels seem to have certain roles that they're they're good at or what they're known for. But is there also another level of angels that are waiting to assist that maybe aren't of the archangel kingdom. Yeah, they're all available to you. And and what's I think what helps, and we can talk about this in a little bit or whenever you want, we are operating in a third dimensional frequency, a vibration. It's not a place. Dimension is not a place. It's a frequency. It's a vibration. They are operating in higher frequencies and vibrations, just like some of the Aboriginal tribes people that we met. They were operating at a much higher frequency and that allow our dimension, if you will, that allowed them to see things that we can't see in the third. It's like reminds me of a propeller on a plane. It's spinning too fast. It's moving too quickly. You can't see it until it slows down. So because these angels are operating in a higher dimension, they're operating at a higher frequency, they are able very easily to help us in the third dimension. It's child's play. For but again, they're governed by what's in the highest good of all in your soul's intention. But so we have this in our human minds, this hierarchy of angels, right? We think there's this and then there's this and there's this, but they are operating at a higher frequency. So I would say that the archangels are probably the ones that are known as like Raphael is fabulous for healing. I call on Raphael for healing. He's also part of, Raphael's also part of the team, my healing team. Metatron is fabulous if you're having problems with the body and grounding. I call them Metatron when it's too much energy and I get dizzy and it almost makes me sick because it's too much energy coming in. I call in Metatron. Thank you for helping me adjust to this. Michael is fabulous for protection. Archangel Michael for protection. Then you have the guardian angels who are assigned to us in this particular lifetime, which is different each lifetime. And then you have other angels and who are there to assist us as well. And we've never had this level of assistance before in the planet. Never. There are so many angels waiting to assist, waiting to be asked to help because we're shifting into these higher frequencies, these loving, more love-based, higher awareness, consciousness, higher vibration. So that, and the spirit guide, now the angels have not incarnated as human beings. They can take on a human form, but they don't need to. It's like going to a school, they're way beyond, right? Mm -hmm. But spirit guides have. And so they have had many, many lifetimes where they've become very awakened, have a very high consciousness and are vibrating at a very high frequency as well. So when I'm writing blogs, for instance, or articles, I'll have a different spirit guide come through me 
working with me, guiding me on that writing. And I have to say, some are easier to work with than others. Some I can easily pick up on others. And and there were times I have to admit I get frustrated and say I I can't I can't understand what you're trying to to guide me with. And so I'm like, can I have? So it's free will, right? You say, like, can I have somebody that I can work with a little easier? So you are the free will person, human being, you tell them what works for you. What do you need? How can they assist? Yeah. And let's go back to the dimensions because I love that. You had it in the back of your book and you described the different levels. So for anyone where some of the, some of this talk of third dimension, fourth dimension, fifth dimension, I know I've, I have a couple of guests that have come on more recently talking about how we're moving into this fifth dimension as a consciousness and I was getting a little confused too for a while and I'm starting to finally grasp it and understand yeah. what's going on. So can you take us through just giving us a brief understanding of yeah. the different levels and the different dimensions? Yeah. So in this Angels and Waiting book, in the appendix at the end, I have all about the d- dimensions because it's something that's so important. And I remember when I was creating the audio book, the, the, the audio the, the engineer is like, oh, I don't know why authors always feel so like they need an appendix. I'm like, I'm so excited about my appendix because it talks about the dimensions. So dimensions, again, are not a place. It's a frequency. frequency. And so when you are, this particular planet is currently serving third dimensional frequencies. This is like a learning ground, a learning lab for third dimensional frequencies. Planet Earth, Mother Earth, Gaia, has chosen to shift into becoming a fourth, fifth dimensional. You move through fourth and then you move into that higher frequency. She's choosing to become a fifth dimensional frequency vibration and service those beings vibrating at that level. So she's shifting. And everything on her needs to shift as well. It's very uncomfortable to be at two different frequencies. It's like a washing machine out of sync, right? A lot of banging going on. So what we're seeing is that those who are, there's a lot happening on the planet as we shift into more love-based, higher frequencies. It's a greater consciousness. It's more compassion. It's more service to others. Lower third dimension is more there's a lot of mind driving driving us there's a lot of anxiety depression disease that's a lot of really bizarre thinking is third dimension and so when you as an example when you have felt extreme joy extreme gratitude extreme happiness extreme awe that's touching into the fourth dimension that frequency, that vibration. Now, the key is to learn how to stay up in that frequency mm-hmm. rather than get pulled back down into the depression, the angst, the fear. So that's what the they're here. The guides and angels are here to assist us, to help us shift into these higher frequencies and stay there. And when you shift into the fifth, you it's just very love-based. You have acceptance, you have compassion, And so you realize when you shift into the fourth and fifth vibrational frequencies, so much of what we believe in the third is just bizarre and absurd. Mm -hmm. And you can't do that when you're in these. For instance, when you're in fourth, you would not want to be eating animals and putting them through what we put them through. It's just, you just wouldn't be comfortable doing that. It just seems quite bizarre to you. So this is where, as you gain this higher consciousness, and like Einstein said, and you can't solve problems with the same degree of consciousness. It takes a higher consciousness. I'm, I'm not quoting him exactly, but it's it takes a higher consciousness to solve those problems that you've created with this lower consciousness and that's what's happening and so this is why we've had we've never had this level of help before to help shift us into these higher frequencies and a greater awareness and it's happening it may not look like it but it's definitely happening one by one around the planet and let me just say i've been helping people i do consultations and i've been doing it for a very very long time i in the last six months have never had so many young people who are incredibly gifted and abilities that are off the charts they're coming to me in their early 20s there and usually it was older people who would or middle-aged people i'm getting so many younger people with these crazy abilities and they want to know how can i help Mm -hmm. what am i here to do how am i here to do it and this is where what i tell them is 
become a team player with these beautiful beings from the other side where they can guide you as to how you are here to assist, what you're here to do, and how to do it. And that makes a big difference. They're here for a reason. We'll then allow them to guide you on how to be the human member of the team. Yeah, and when you're saying Gaia, Mother Earth, is moving in to more of this fifth dimension frequency, I mean, what what comes to mind is like it's very subtle, but it's not subtle if you're able to yeah. see it. I, I've had so many people when I, we kind of talk about this, some people will say, April, how could you say that the world is becoming more loving when all I feel like there's just more hate, there's more political disrupt, there's people are so angry lately. It's really interesting how a person can look at the world today and feel like we are not moving towards love. We feel like we're de-evolving in some ways. But I feel like the example, as you say, we're moving more towards the heart, more towards the love. If you take, for example, a Black Lives Matter movement, right? And the, just the push for that and the publicity around it and what has happened more recently in the past couple of years. Children moving into this place of love and acceptance of all genders, right? And children and adolescents trying to identify who do they love? And they're like, I love anyone and everyone. And they're not conforming. Like I just had this talk with a friend the other day, how to almost be, have like, the term heterosexual is almost not of the norm anymore. It's more like the choice is to rather be more in the state of I will love a man or a woman. It doesn't matter the gender. Right. There, you know, there's like right. energy moving more towards loving the soul rather than having these labels. The other thing that I see is just how there are so many movements in New York State. We banned the plastic bags, right? This is a small yes. example. And the straws, right? Yeah. Working on that. But these are the subtle changes that I feel like you're talking about that the human race here and people on the planet are really trying to help and make these shifts to live in a world that really does care about the earth, that right. we're trying to take these steps to help the oceans, help the life. We're, there are masses of people really fighting for justice and equality and to be loved and to be treated equally. So it, although there, it may appear that there's like a lot of ugliness and a lot of people arguing and fighting about this, when you begin to see the change and what that means if we begin to become more sensitive in our language, more sensitive in the way that we're looking at people who may not fit into the box of our generation, that we are really are moving more towards an energy of love and acceptance of all. Absolutely. Absolutely. But first, you have to have an awareness. Right. And we're at that very uncomfortable place where we're becoming aware of what, like I said, those triggers. We're becoming aware of where we're getting stuck, what needs to change. And a lot of it's been buried in the past. And now it's becoming more out there. It's coming to the surface. So the truth is coming to the surface as well. It's all coming up in our face. And right now it feels like there's just so much because it's, again, that's the beauty of planet Earth. It will help you shift and evolve very quickly very quickly. So that's why it's here to help us gain an awareness. And some people aren't ready for that change yet. Mm -hmm. That's okay. They're not ready to move beyond a third dimensional schoolroom, so to speak. That's okay. But this will no longer service that type of uh, vibration at some point. Yeah. So uh, well, let me just say this, because I think this will help the, the listeners as well. I have a six-year-old grandson and I am, what they're telling me is that a lot of the changes that we wish to see happen will happen in his life. I have a 36-year-old son and they're saying, well, some of that will happen in his lifetime. Some will happen in mine. He's 67. Some will happen in my, my son's lifetime. But a lot of what we're wanting to see will happen in my grandson's lifetime. So mm -hmm. we're at the beginning of that. We're like the forerunners, right? We're at the beginning of that bell curve. And a lot of us, and I'm sure an awful lot of your listeners are here adding that awareness, that higher consciousness, that expanded consciousness, that higher vibration to the collective mm -hmm. to help shift all of them. So you might be a couple generations ahead and feel like, oh, this is such a crazy primitive planet. It is, but you're here to help. And we're not here to judge. We're not here to hang out in fear and negativity. We're here to envision and hold the vision of peace and harmony. We're here to hold that being of service to others, finding compassion, very importantly, having acceptance, 
We don't have to like it, but accept that this is where other people are at. This is what they need to help them shift and move. And is it, is that the classroom I'm going to hang out in? Because I certainly signed up for enough other classes, right? Mm -hmm. I don't, I, I'm not here to judge others who are just at the beginning stages of learning. Again, we're all equal as souls, but some are more evolved than others. So we find compassion and acceptance for those who are still learning some of these beginning stages of a higher awareness, a higher consciousness. Yeah. And if we tie it back into what we were talking about earlier on in experiencing more of the higher frequency emotions rather than fear, it's kind of like we want to be in this place because it's also going to help, I think, hopefully our existence in the physical body to move through age a little bit more with ease, even if there is yes. a journey or something that we have to learn. But if you can have that understanding and really try to hold even through struggle or illness, the, the frequency of love, forgiveness, like you said, acceptance, joy. Right. Right. And those are all things that can really make our existence in this tough place yes. a little bit easier. Right. So you start recognizing when your mind is still stuck hmm. and, and when you're moving with love from the heart where things flow and your body will help you recognize. It's kind of like if you keep having these, like, for instance, fear. A lot of people have a lot of fear right now. And fibromyalgia is a autoimmune system. I had it for a reason, that it's an autoimmune system that affects the entire system. That means you've got system-wide fear. And it used to just be women. Now we're seeing it in men as well. And we're seeing it in younger and younger people all the time. They're coming down with fibromyalgia. That's telling you that you have a lot of fears throughout your whole system. It's kind of like if you keep ignoring these emotions and you keep having them, like you keep having a lot of fear, the body's going to start breaking down and showing you you develop fibromyalgia down the road, right? So you start realizing, okay, how bad does it have to get before you're willing to make those changes? Mm -hmm. Because the body can really get your attention very quickly. And a lot of people will ignore a lot of stuff. But when that body starts creating problems, now they're listening. Now they're willing to make changes. So it works together. And we have tremendous help to help us with all of this. Gain the awareness, not just gain awareness, but help you move through it help you let go, help you heal, help you move out of that mind and show you where it's getting stuck, help you get unstuck and move into peace. So that at some point, again, as you move up into these higher frequencies, you're just in peace. That's your default. You're just okay. You're just fine with whatever's going on. It's not a head buried in the sand approach. It's just that you just recognize it's part of the growth process. It's Perfect. necessary to shift us individually and collectively and planetary wise. Awesome. Well, this book was amazing. Thank Angels you. And waiting, people. So if you're feeling lonely, if you don't know how to access this help, it's a great guide. There's great case studies in here. Robbie and Judy really did a beautiful job. I loved our conversation today. It was a lot of fun. We covered a lot, a lot really quickly. I love the energy of it. And so can you let people know um, a little bit more about like the classes that you're teaching that you're going to have on Zoom that now works. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, that's right. Zoom does work. I, you know, I'm, we've been getting this information out there, making it available to people. So if you go to my website, holeswellness.com, that's H-O-L-Z-W-E-L-L-N-E-S-S, -S, holeswellness.com. We put all this information up there. We put a, an online healing course. We, we have the books, uh, the Aboriginal healing principles. I mean, it's all there so that this information is there for people to access, whether it's an audio book or it's a paperback or it's a Kindle version. We're just trying to get this information out there to make it available globally. And it's exciting to see people taking it and running with it. Yeah. And I think that's beautiful too, because it's not doing anybody justice to keep the secrets of healing secret. <laughs> right. No. So uh, people, we, yeah. people need to know this. They need to, yeah. people want to know, people want to access, don't want to be in suffering and in pain. Yeah. And if we can learn to do that ourselves and tap it into our, tap into ourselves, maybe with, with a guide that can help. But ultimately, if we can have these tools internally, that that's the key because then we can spread spread it to so many other people. Every person that comes in contact with us will be changed and better for it because yes. we're holding it within ourselves. So I think it's great the information you have out there for people. Thank you.
Yeah, it was lovely to have you. Thank you, Robbie. And thank you everyone for listening today. Again, the title of the book is Angels in Waiting, How to Reach Out to Your Guardian Angels and Spirit Guides by Robbie Holtz with Judy Katz. So thank you all for listening. I will bring you another amazing guest next week. And if you would like to watch this interview, go on over to path11tv.com and you can actually watch us having this conversation instead of listening. But if you love to listen, that's fine too. Listen wherever you listen to your podcast. And thanks again, everyone. Take care. Thanks so much for tuning in to today's show. If you haven't already, please subscribe and rate and review the Path 11 podcast in Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Also, this podcast is made possible by our sponsor, Path 11 TV. Visit path11tv.com to start a seven-day free trial and start streaming over 100 hours of exclusive video content on consciousness, healing, and life after death. That's path11tv.com and be sure to use coupon code podcast30 to take 30% off your annual membership. Start satisfying your spiritual curiosity with a membership to Path 11 TV today. Bye for now.